This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Well, now I'm going to go through and introduce one of the newer accounting standards. Now, depending upon when you studied for F7, your financial reporting, will depend upon whether or not you've actually already covered IFRS 15 before. Uh, if you've studied F7 recently, then you will have studied IFRS 15. If you studied F7 a long time ago, then you would have possibly studied under IS 18 and IS 11. So therefore, IFRS 15 will be entirely new to you. So what I'm going to go through and do is to make sure that we cover everything uh, and cover what people have or may not have covered previously. I'm just going to assume that we've never done IFRS 15 before. OK, uh, so for those of you who have gone through and seen it before in F7, it's good to recap the fundamental principles and what we're talking about. And then for those of you who have never seen IFRS 15 before, you're in luck. We're going to go through and cover everything so that you will be in no worse position than those people who have already studied it. Uh, as it's a new accounting standard, it's also uh, got that current issues flavour. I think now it already has been examined as a current issues question, but... Uh, it will therefore then be more likely to appear in question two or question three, which it has again. Uh, so although there was previously potential for it to be current issues, I'm still going to talk about it as a current issue to help you understand where we head to and how we get there with regards to our current issue. So it does actually touch upon some of the old accounting rules for IS18 and IS11. Okay. Uh, in terms of what we're going to do, I think we've got two videos. Uh, this first video is going to look at things as to, to what the issues were with the old standards. So once we've then done that and we can understand what the issues were, we can then look at the new standard, how that's been developed and how ultimately we can then answer exam style questions. Again, like I tried to do, I'm going to try and keep it as simple as possible as we work our way through. Having said that, it's still quite a challenge. So let's go through. Uh, first of all, have a look at the introduction. Uh, so we now have IFRS 15. That is the examinable standard. Uh, the two old standards that are now no longer in existence are IS 18 revenue and IS 11 construction contracts. Essentially, IFRS 15 is a hybrid and brings together the two, which goes through and uses a more set of detailed principles to go through and cover both of those accounting areas. So whether or not you make your sales with regards to the sale of goods, the provision of services, or whether you are constructing an asset on behalf of somebody else under a contract, IFRS 15 will cover all of those aspects following the same specific rules. Okay. Uh, if you want a little bit more detail, the page on the ISB website is detailed there that talks you through the revenue recognition project. Uh, if you're so interested, it's there. Uh, we'll touch upon this more when we get to the current issue right at the very end. But you can see there that it's gone through various different stages. Is it there? There's an agenda decision, uh, a discussion paper, an exposure draft, the revised exposure draft, the IFRS. So uh, within the, the second, if you like, part of the videos, that's where we look at the most up to date rules and the IFRS. And then also as well, when we talk about things in current issues, we'll also see that the effective date and when we need to apply it by has been put back because it is such a radical change in terms of accounting rules. We need to go through there and ensure that businesses are happy with those changes because it's not just a question of updating the accounting knowledge of those preparing the financial statements. It's also a question of updating the systems and that there can be uh, quite a challenge to ensure that those systems are updated to incorporate revenue recognition in, in the correct fashion. A lot of the most recent accounting scandals, uh, particularly ones in the UK, you may have heard of Tesco's, they were involved in a recent accounting scandal. And again, that came about because of the issues surrounding revenue recognition. Hopefully now with the newer, more up-to-date IFRS 15, you will no longer have those issues, but who knows? Uh, so what we've got there, if we go through and look at the old IS-18, I'm not too worried about IS-11, I'll focus on IS-18, because again, for those of you who have only ever studied IFRS 15, you'll have no idea what this is all about. But just to give you an idea of what we previously had under IS-18, it predominantly focused on the sale of goods and the provision of services. Uh, and we look at the recognition criteria. So of those four recognition criteria, you can see at the two at the bottom, 
probable economic benefit to measure reliably, uh, both for, for goods and the two at the bottom of the services, both come from the framework, don't they? So that was a good starting point that we were using the principles of the framework, but then adding to that to give us more specific guidance. However, what we had there was there was speak about a substantial transfer of risk and reward. And again, people were unsure by what we meant with regard to substantial and also there no managerial control. What was specifically meant by no managerial involvement following that sale? Okay, And that led us to various issues. With regards to services, uh, measuring the stage of complete, there was no detailed guidance with regards to how complete your service was. So if you were providing, say, uh, selling a warranty service over a period of one, two or three years uh, or repairs or maintenance service, how do we go through there and recognise that revenue on a stage of completion? There was various different measures that we could use, none of which ensured, if you like, comparability and consistency amongst entities, which is one of, isn't it, comparability, one of the enhancing qualitative characteristics. So bits of IS18 didn't necessarily follow directly what we had from the framework so, so there were issues there uh, in terms of the measurement again there was a lack of detail if you like with regards to the measurement goods were measured at the fair value of the goods and you know is18 was developed way before ifrs 13 so there was no specific details with regards to the fair value of the goods similarly in terms of the service nothing there with regards to the fair value of the service so you know with the service that might involve some form of discounting because a service is provided over a period of time uh, do we give consideration to that under IS18? Again, that could give you difficulty. And then when you provide goods and services, so an example we'll touch upon later on is looking at the sale of a mobile phone, which is a sale of a good, and the provision of a service, which is that the mobile contract with, with the data and the all-inclusive minutes. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. That essentially is a service, isn't it? And, and that was bundled together. So you would buy handsets and the minutes and data all in one package and pay for them both. How do we account for that? What do we recognise with regards to the revenue? What do we recognise for the service and the data and the minutes? Goodness only knows what would happen there if you had a fixed number of minutes and you didn't use them and then they were rolled over to the following period. <laughs> it gets, gets really complicated. Uh, so some of the issues that we had was that essentially there's limited revenue recognition guidance that you have for the goods and services and goods and services. Although there was guidance, it was pretty limited. And if you were to compare that to the equivalent US standard, there was much, much, much more guidance. So it was a, a, also an attempt to try and converge the two to make sure there that there was more detailed guidance as opposed to just putting in lots and lots of new rules. OK, uh, it's all more guidance, uh, although there are, if you like, some some rules to follow. Uh, likewise, as well, uh, we want to make sure that all the transactions are faithfully represented. Uh, we had the issues with Tesco's and they were recognising revenue too early. So we might have issues there in terms of looking at assets and liabilities. So assets thinking about a receivable, liabilities thinking about maybe some deferred income and maybe that was not consistent with the framework. And then looking at income expenses, I suppose income is the most important aspect, isn't it, with regards to revenue? OK. Uh, and Tesco's were maybe recognising revenue too early uh, and therefore not faithfully representing the nature of the transaction. OK, you know, when we look at the sale of goods and the substantial transfer of risk and reward of ownership, when does that transfer of risk and reward of ownership actually happen? You know, these goods could get delivered over over long distances. Is it when it leaves the factory? Is it when it is, is physically delivered to the customer? You know. Is it when the customer actually makes the order? So, you know, there's, there's several different periods where revenue could be recognised and companies have tried to recognise it too early, which doesn't faithfully represent the transaction. Uh, the principles tend not to be consistent with other accounting standards. So a lot of the accounting standards are all position based, aren't they? If you think about pensions, share based payments, deferred tax, you know, if you get the position figure right at the start of the year, and at the end of the year, the movement will either go to profit or loss or OCI. Uh, what we will see with IFRS 15 later on is that it still isn't positional focused. It's still very much working out the revenue figure and then the SFP figures follow on afterwards. So ever so slightly controversial, but I think that's something that we can neglect, particularly when you think that revenue is shown worth in the statement of profit or loss. So let's look at getting that right and, and then thinking about everything else afterwards. So just a bit different to what normal accounting standards go through and do. Uh, the other one we mentioned there, uh, different applications of risk and reward of ownership uh, that reduces comparability 
and you've got multiple accounting standards. I mentioned that IS 17, IS 11, but if you think about leases, which we'll look at a bit later, you know, we've looked at F7 and leases from the lessee's perspective and the payments, but what about from the lessor's perspective and the income? Likewise, if you go through and think about financial assets, when you think about your financial assets, you get income there, don't we, with regards to the effective rate of interest being your interest income. So again, that's covered by IFRS 9. And there's just too many accounting standards dealing with too many areas of income. So your headline revenue figure is now covered by IFRS 15. Uh, if we go through and just start to look at some of the issues that we've got, particularly with the goods and services and the telecoms industry, uh, I've just thrown in some illustrations uh, to, to help you understand what, what the issues are uh, so that hopefully you can go through and see there. Uh, it says explain how the revenue should be recognized in Telefonica's financial statements. So in the statement of financial position, statement of profit or loss. I'm not worried about the position statement. It's all profit or loss focused. So it says here you may have you know entered into transactions similar to this previously. Telefonica sells mobile phones, selling them for free. Uh, when a customer signs up for a 12 month call and data contract and it costs you $45 per month. So you spend quite a lot of money per month because essentially you've got the phone for free. Now we're going to ignore any discounting or anything crazy like that. Keep it nice and simple. The standard, the updated standard does that. Anything less than a year, we tend not to discount because the time value of money is not material and therefore it is not relevant. Uh, so what we've got there is 12 months, $45 per month. How would we recognize it? Uh, and the goods as well. well. The obvious one would be the revenue uh, from the services is $45 per month at the end of each month. Let's not worry about rolling over any unused minutes or call data. Uh, and then the revenue for the handset, there's nothing recognized at all because it's essentially free. And that's what a lot of telephone companies have gone through and done in the past. However, when you go through and buy your mobile phones, sometimes you don't like to buy one big contract, do you, with the phone and the data and inclusive minutes together. So what you might do is you might buy a handset. So you might want the most latest, funky, up-to-date handset and you pay quite a considerable amount for that up front today. And then you pay for the calls and data with your data and mobile phone provider and pay for that separately. So that's what we've got here. You know, there is, if you like, without that annual contract. So here it says, explain how the revenue should be recognized in Vodafone's financial statements. So we sell mobile phones without that monthly or that annual contract, uh, selling the handset separately for $240 uh, and call and data charges are $20 per month. So some, if you like standalone prices for the handset is $240. And because you've gone through and are not paying for the phone essentially on a monthly basis you know all you're paying for is the call and data charges in that package you will therefore pay less than was it that the 45 dollars per month that we previously had so in terms of the revenue being recognized uh you recognize the revenue from the sale of goods immediately so 240 dollars boom straight away because if you think about the the revenue from the sale of goods there is a substantial transfer risk and reward of ownership isn't it uh, as the sale has taken place and you've taken the phone out of the package and gone home and started phoning all your friends. Uh, there's no managerial control. No one can tell you from the shop how to utilize your phone. Uh, there's a probable inflow of economic benefit because the business is going to receive the cash and you can measure that value reliably. So the $240 it is recognized immediately, isn't it? Uh, for the provision of the services, what then happens is at the end of each month, they will then recognize the $20 worth of income. Again, it's a much lower amount, isn't it, than what we would have gone through and recognized if we bundled them together, given the phone for free and show $45 as monthly income. So if we go through and summarize and just make the assumption uh, that the mobile phone itself costs $200. So Telefonica and Vodafone have each paid $200 to buy the handset. If you look at what happens, particularly if you think about Vodafone, uh, they make profit in the first month, don't they? Because they've got the revenue, the revenue from the services, totaling 260. The cost is 200, so they recognize their revenue of 60 at a much earlier point in time, don't we? However, when you look at Telefonica, there's no revenue from the goods. So therefore, in that first month, they make a loss because they sold the handset for free. However, what then happens is that in the following months, two, three, four, and for the following nine months at the end of the year, 
they generate more revenue per month than what Vodafone does. So there's a lack of comparability, isn't there, between Telefonica and Vodafone uh, overall for the period that there's going to be a very similar amount of profit. I think what you'll find is that Telefonica have charged $45, uh, so charging a little bit more, uh, not just for the mobile handset as well, but maybe a little bit of interest on top. But we're not worried about the interest, but that is what they have done. They've incorporated some additional interest into that monthly sales service figure. Uh, but overall, the revenues in total are, are going to be fairly similar. But if you look at it on a monthly basis, depending upon where the cutoff point is for your year end, depending upon when handsets are sold, uh, you know, you're going to end up with different profits in different months. Uh, so therefore, you can have different profits in different years comparing one entity to another. And I, as an investor, would want to know, should I invest in Telefonica or Vodafone? Well, if the cutoff was the end of the first month, then that was our year end. You know, and I'd be investing in Vodafone, wouldn't I? Because it looks like they've made the profits. OK, Telefonica has made a huge loss. Little am I to know that Telefonica is going to make more profits into the future than what Vodafone is going to do. So it doesn't really give a fair presentation of the results because essentially it's the same transaction, isn't it? The sale of a mobile phone and call and data minutes. But unfortunately, they're done at different values and done at different accounting methods okay so that was the issue uh and the big impact in terms of businesses that we're going to go through and see is clearly on the telecommunications business uh likewise in terms of software developments uh when software development companies sell software on top of the actual software they sell other bits and pieces on top uh so are they selling goods are they selling services is there a little bit of both in which case we need to try and split out the revenue from the sale of the goods and the revenue from the sale of the services, maybe the updates of the services and the installation. OK, uh, and then in terms of real estate, that's very American, isn't it? Real estate. Uh, but going through there and, and houses, if you're constructing houses, are you constructing the goods or are you just carrying out a service on behalf of somebody else? OK, and that's going to go through there and have a big impact, if you like, on real estate and the construction of real estate. OK. Uh, again, real estate, you know, are you acting as an agent, essentially, and, and selling a house for somebody else? Because if you are the agent, then you should just be going through there and recognising the commission on the sale, uh, as opposed to the, the amount of money that you are collecting as the agent. OK, so there's going to be quite a big impact across those various industries. We've demonstrated one of the issues with regards to telecommunications and the unbundling of goods and services. Software development could have similar implications. So we'll touch upon that a little bit later. Real estate. Uh, I'm not too worried about as at this point in time. But for now, I hope you're happy with the issues that we have with regards to the old standard. Uh, and now what we're going to go through and do within the next video is start to actually look at the specific with regards to IFRS 15.